I'm Ross. I work at Flickr. And uh, we are going to go over a little bit about our new photo page, uh, which we made using YUI3 and the Yahoo Performance Guidelines. Um, this is a page that was in the past extremely slow for us. Uh, like I said, about five to six seconds to load. And uh, the goal of the project was to take YUI3 and the performance guidelines and get this down to about a second or two seconds to, to load the page. So at the beginning, we took a look at using YUI3 on top of our existing infrastructure. It's an attractive alternative because you don't have to rewrite all your code, but you don't really get the savings. You don't really get the performance benefit from doing this. So what we decided to do at the very beginning, um, this is about six months before the project started, was wipe everything. Start from a clean slate. And uh, to be fair, this is not something that every site can do when they port to a new JavaScript library. This is something we had, uh, we're sort of uh, fortunate enough to be able to do. So uh, the ground rules for this, we started with a clean slate, no JS, no CSS, everything rewritten from YUI3. And I've got to say, uh, just to start us off, YUI3 was fantastic. Uh, it gave us a lot of things for free in the performance side of things. Um, it has the concept of modules. Every module can be loaded in a sort of deferred manner. Uh, everything loads at the bottom of the page. Everything is really nice and self-contained. To contrast this to our old style, we had tons of global variables. Everything was loaded at the top. We had massive monolithic JavaScript files that would always load at the top of every page, which would block everything. So just as a, as a base, YUI3 gives us all those great things. Uh, gives you all the widgets, gives you all the convenience methods, all the browser normalization. So everything with YUI3 was fantastic, except for a few small things that really caught us. Um, most of these caught us after launch. And these are things that um, when you have 80 million users, you're going to have a few edge cases that run into really strange problems. And the majority of this talk is talking about the very strange problems that we found using YUI3 in the performance guidelines. So the first problem, deferred JS. So we have, we're fortunate enough to have a really active user base who goes into our forums and tells us whenever anything's wrong. So we launched our new photo page. We have just mountains of posts just like this. The old page is better. The new page is so slow. Why did you do this? Why did you waste all this time? And to us, we're a little shocked. When you use our you know, T3 connections in the office with our brand new laptops and our latest version of Chrome, everything loads great. Uh, we see load times for Safari of 900 milliseconds, for Chrome of a second and a half. Um, for IE, which is our worst case, we basically cut the load time in half. And for other browsers, we saw it cut by about 80%. So we see these, and we are super confused. We don't know what's going on. Um, and then we see a different class of problems being reported, which is that some guys go to this page and they go across all these different browsers and change all their settings and all the different computers and they have no JS on the page. Um, and the fact that they can do different computers, different browsers, different OSs, and they still don't get JS really has us stumped. So these are the two problems we were seeing. And uh, really these both stem from sort of the same thing. Um, one of the first performance recommendations is to move all your JS to the bottom of the page. This makes a lot of sense, JavaScript blocks. Move to the bottom of the page, you can have all of your content, which to us is the photo, the most important thing, load super fast without JS. This has a few problems. So like us, I'm sure a lot of people have sites that depend heavily on JS. When you click on a button, it pops up a modal in page, or it does other things um, in the page without reloading. If you have all your JS at the bottom of the page, all these event handlers don't load until everything else loads. And to walk you through sort of a basic waterfall of how our page load looks, you have the HTML come down with the CSS. You have the YUI3 seed load. It uh, detects which modules it needs to load. It makes another request and loads a big batch of JS. So at this point, we're talking maybe two seconds for some browsers after the page loads before they get this JS. So that's two seconds where the users are clicking around, and all the different elements on the page have no JS. Now, because we like to think we're decent engineers, we have non-JS fallbacks for every single one of our links. So everything that has a JS action associated with it also has a page it takes you to to perform the same action. And in this two seconds before any sort of JS loads, anytime you click on one of these buttons, it takes you to a new page. So this is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do, just have this great in-page experience. Um, and this is something that's a really common problem. Uh, we have a lot of users that are on you know, older versions of IE6 um, and that have dial-up connections and slow computers, and for them, it's not two seconds, it could be more like four seconds or five seconds. It's a long time to be on a page and have it take you to different things instead of load the correct JS interface. So our solution to this um, is a thing we call action queuing. So what we've done is we've taken a little bit of JS and we put it at the very top of the page in line, 
So it doesn't have to take, do another HTTP request. It doesn't have to block, okay, except to execute. And the action queuing does three things for us. It puts um, an event handler on every single JS link that says when somebody clicks on this, don't take them to the fall through. Just do nothing. Second thing it does is it can do some sort of interim action. So if they click on a button that's supposed to bring up this beautiful full screen view, uh, instead of doing all the JavaScript for that, we can just do part of it. We can just show the black background so it looks like something has happened. That's really easy to do. And the third thing it does is it queues an action up so that when the particular modules that run these different buttons do load, they can register with this and they can say, hi, I'm here. What's happened in the meantime? And we can say, okay, the user's clicked on this button, they've clicked on this link, and they've typed into here. And then the actual uh, YUI modules, which have all of our code, can look through these different actions and say, okay, I need to clean up something for this one, I need to log something for this one, I need to make an API call for this one. It's a little tricky because all of the interim actions you do in your action queue um, have to be done with just basic JS because we do this before any YUI3 um, normalization loads. So if you're doing event attachment, you have to sort of write your own mini event library. If you're doing any sort of complicated animation, you have to write your own small animation library. And you've got to test the hell out of it because unlike YUI3 stuff, which just works across browsers, your stuff you've got to make sure does all the correct cases for all the different browsers. We found it works really well for us. We do it for very simple things. For the most case, we're just doing some sort of loading indicator to say, okay, a user clicked on this, we show them some sort of feedback, and then we log the action. Something that helps a lot with this um, is the idea of having different loading indicators. So to walk you through sort of a process of what we've done for this, see we have that action button at the top. Um, initially, we had it so that when you would click it, it would look like the button depresses. So we basically swap a CSS class. And that wasn't really enough for users, so now we put in this little um, modal window with a loading indicator. And the second our JSS pops in, our JS pops in, it takes this and applies a CSS class that expands it out and shows the full action menu. So kind of a nice touch. It's worth noting that this is just really a cheap ploy. There is absolutely nothing that's improving performance about this. There's absolutely nothing that's making the page actually faster. In fact, it's making it a little slower because we have that JS at the top of the page. What it's doing is it's improving the perceived performance. When users click around the page, it's making it seem like something is actually happening. Oh, look, this button depresses, this little indicator comes up. It's really just about making it feel a little faster, especially for the users that are on you know, IE6 and slow connections, and it's gonna be a good five seconds before the real stuff kicks in. At least something looks like it's happening now. So we found this really removed all the complaints we had about slow JS. This and a few other things we'll get into. <coughs> Next problem. This is a really interesting one. This is the sort of thing that you can't really test. You don't really know about this until you've launched your site and you have a million users hit it and all the crazy edge cases come out. Um, so this is a little hard to see with the blue, but this is one JavaScript URL right here. Uh, <laughs> What we do is we use uh, the YUI3 mechanism for only loading the modules you need on the page. So what it does is it looks and it says, here's the 27 modules I'm using. Only request a JavaScript file that has these 27 URLs loaded up together into one file. It's really nice because we have a single monolithic file. Um, we're using a combo handler, so what it does is it takes all these different modules, folds them up on the fly the first time, and then caches that. So only one user has the, um, the sort of slowness of getting all these things pushed into one file. And we really got into modules pretty heavily. We love modules. Every small bit of self-contained code is a new module. So on a page like this, this could be 50 modules. Maybe that's a little overkill, but who knows. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have 2,700 character URLs. To us, this doesn't really seem like a problem. Uh, YUI Loader does the right thing for browsers that don't support long URLs, like IE. It will cut this into two requests, and you're fine. The problem we found is that it wasn't necessarily anything client-side. This was the problem where users come to our forums and they say, I've tried it across these nine browsers, I've tried it across several computers, I cannot get JS to load on your page, what's going on? So it turns out that a very small section of users sits behind a firewall that will, will truncate URL length. We don't entirely know why this is. Um, my hunch is that sometime in the past there's been some sort of attack, maybe some sort of buffer overflow attack that uses super long URLs. And so there are some firewalls out there that still just truncate URLs. So if you go to the URL that's 3,000 characters, it will pick whatever its limit is, say 2,048, and everything beyond that just gets cut off. So what happens is if you see a long URL like this, and say 2,000 characters is here, you'll get all the modules before this, and you won't get any of the modules after it. 
And because of the way dependencies work, some things might work, some things might not. It turns out a lot of the things that are important for making the page look like JS is loaded were in this last little section here because they're the high-level modules we load on top of the low-level stuff. So these users, JS was coming in, JS was enabled. It looks like nothing was happening for them. And because some stuff was working, some stuff wasn't, it was really hard for us to diagnose this. In the end, um, some of the users actually sort of figured this out ourselves. We made a test page where they would go to, and it would have a green line that would show just how many characters they can load in their URL. So um, in order to fix this problem, basically you've got to have shorter URLs. Now we don't want to ruin our architecture and merge our modules together. We don't even really want to mess with our module names because these names are descriptive. They're, you know, they're meaningful to us. We don't want to have modules called a.js, b.js. So what we've decided to do, um, and there's several approaches you can take to this, what we've done is to do string substitution. So again, it's hard to see, but instead of having nice module names, you see a string of characters, dn, dash bb, dash da. Um, so we had one of our uh, really smart back engineers do a lot of analyses on the logs. And he took every single word that we use in every JS module and do a frequency count on it and figure out which ones need to be substituted. So here, where you see uh, the letter A, that could be person. When you see the letter B, that could be JS. Um, so basically, everything got a one or two character substitution. Uh, the nice thing is this is a reversible algorithm. We can do it on the front end when we put this into the page. We can do it on the back end to figure out what models we actually need. Um, the downside is it doesn't actually help us that much. This got us down to 1,700 characters. We found this is below the limit for pretty much every single crazy firewall out there. Uh, we found 2,000 characters is about the limit. Anything below that, and you're pretty much going to be safe. There is still a small subset that has a problem. We'll get to that in a second. Um, there are different uh, approaches you could take to this. Also, you could do sort of a URL shortening approach, so something like Bitly does, which is to take the whole massive URL like this and say, okay, I'm going to store this combination of modules in the database as a four-letter you know, character string. The problem with that is you start to get databases involved, and we didn't really want to take the hit of doing a query. So for us, we're going to stick with string substitution for now, but there's definitely ways of getting this URL much, much shorter. This is the one we just picked. So there are some users that still have a problem. It turns out a very specific model of uh, Sonic Firewall um, had a default configuration that had it at 1,600 characters. This is just below where ours is now, so they still get a few modules cut off. Right now, it's only a couple of users that have this problem, so we're sort of going to sit on this, and just a lot more people have this problem, we'll fix it then. But uh, we're going to have to choose a different shortening scheme to get below 1,600 characters, and we're not ready to do that yet. So some users, I mean, really, a firewall sort of on their side anyway. There's only so much we can do. So for those users, we're sort of saying, eh. This problem, yeah, Phil. You can. Um, there are different ways you could do this. You could actually hack the YUI loader so that it will always split the URL requests. So that not just when it detects IE, but it will always say at 1,600 characters split in different requests. We didn't want to penalize the 98% of users that have good firewalls and good connections by having multiple HTTP requests for JavaScript. So what I mean is that you have the default URL. After onload, you can That's a good point. So keep a list in the page of the modules that have loaded. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. So sort of clean up afterwards. Yeah, good point. So this problem we found, uh, this was actually three days ago. Um, so this is an ongoing saga for us. Uh, we had a user that said, your JS just doesn't load for me. And again, across all browsers, um, across all computers they have on this connection, we ran the little test on them that showed where the URL length broke, and it was fine. They could load long URLs. We actually ran all the way up to 8,000 characters, no problem whatsoever. And they still couldn't load any JS. Um, so this guy, this enterprising user, actually went through different logs, went through different things, and found that any URL that has the three letters XXX in it will not load. <laughs> so this is, uh, of course, this guy was at work also. So this is some sort of corporate firewall that is really trying to prevent porn in the worst possible way. Um, and of course, because when you get to the string, I mean, there are actually several cases where we have three X's next to each other because this is programmatically generated. We don't go through this and do any sort of, you know, check for strange words that appear in our random characters. So XXX appears a couple of times. And uh, like, I feel bad this one user. This is going to be in more people who aren't reporting the problem. 
Um, so we actually went through a few days ago and took every single um, algorithm we use for string substitution and have it do a check. If the string XXX appears in any single place, substitute it with something else. And I'm sure someday we're going to get a string that has the word porn in it or something <laughs> awful. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I get the feeling, yeah, so the question was, did we have the same problem with the word ads? I get the feeling there's like a list of words that if we run into, and this is just the first one we came across, and that later when our string substitution gets to the word ads or something, that we're going to run into it too. So we probably need to figure out what that list is and just substitute all of those out. But like I said, this is something really recently. So this is an ongoing strange URL problem for us. Um, but we did the substitution, the user's super happy, and now I'm sure all these corporate users that were getting blocked because of porn now can serve Flickr. Um, so the third problem for us. Um, this is a little bit of a tricky problem. Uh, the basis is convenience methods aren't free. So we noticed that uh, on Internet Explorer 8 and 7, and especially when you get on slower computers, the page was really jerky. Scrolling is the first thing that tipped us off. You'll get to a Flickr page, and you'll scroll, and it'll go like, like really strangely. Um, things that have hover handlers on them would fire a little delayed, like you wouldn't notice as soon as you get over and then it would fire. Um, button clicks wouldn't fire off right away. Uh, and it was just, it was, I mean, IE8, that's a pretty decent browser. It's not fantastic, but you know, it's okay. It shouldn't be doing this. Uh, so we did a lot of investigation and determined that the culprits were using y.delegate a lot and y.on a lot. Uh, so y.on it's a really nice method. You basically pass it an event, you pass it um, some sort of identifier for an element, and it just runs. And it says, oh look, the element isn't on the page yet, so I'm going to pull. Um, this is actually some of the polling um, function right here. And uh, this is nice because you don't have to care really about at what point you run your JavaScript and where your elements are. The downside to this is that polling, uh, when you do this on say 50 elements um, on IE and you're doing a lot of polling, it crushes the browser until things load in. Um, Y.delegate has a really similar system. So delegate is this really great way of doing events where you put an event on a high level thing and everything the blow that fires goes up to this one handler. Again, we thought we were doing the right thing with performance because we're putting one handler instead of a bunch of individual ones. Uh, and we actually found the opposite. What we did is we went through all of our code and got rid of every single instance of delegate and Y.on and uh, we've replaced it with things that specifically get a reference to an element and then do a handler. So y.one.on, y.all.on. And uh, for places where we're using delegate, we actually have our own very lightweight sort of delegate system that doesn't do polling. It doesn't do any sort of checking whether the element's there. It just does a very basic high-level handler and then uh, trigger the event if some sort of uh, test is, is fired on the DOM node. Uh, this fixed all the problem for IE8 and 7. Scrolling was smooth. You could click. The hover events were firing off really well. And really, this is not to, to rag on delegate and on, because delegate and on are fantastic. And in most cases, uh, you wouldn't notice it. I have a feeling we reached some sort of threshold of too many elements polling at the same time, too much going on. Um, but we've used these before and not had a problem. So the, the problem isn't really with these. The problem is that it's really important to know the library you're using. All these convenience methods, even something like y.on, it has a cost, and it adds up when you do it enough. So um, while we have these really high-level libraries like YUI, jQuery, uh, people these days have a tendency to use these libraries without digging into the code beneath them to understand what's happening. And I think this is a really, really horrible idea because you get problems like this. I think it's a really good idea to dig into the code you use to really understand what's happening, uh, to understand the non-trivial costs behind polling on 50 event handlers when you attach them on your page. It's also worth noting that since we load all the JS at the bottom of the page, all of our elements are already there. Every single node that we're attaching is already there, so we don't have to worry about this polling. Um, what was killing IE is that we were doing certain things like loading things after the fact, and it was waiting for all of them. Um, so you might not even need the, the convenience things that these offer you. You might not even need Y.on. So our fourth problem. And, uh, for you, for those of you who are in this room for Philip's fantastic talk on Boomerang, um, this is going to cover a few of the same problems. I'm really jealous of the amount of data he has. And uh, you can basically take the last quarter of my talk and replace it with Philip's talk, and you'll be better off. So if you weren't there, go online and watch it. It was really good. So in a world where you load all of the JS at the bottom of the page and things kick in after 
DOM ready and after window.load, what do you measure to determine how long it takes you to load a page? Um, you can measure window.load, but for us, maybe some JS comes in after that. Um, and maybe you have the problem with older versions of IE where the load a page, everything kicks in, and then it takes a while for the JS to come in and the page to actually be fully there. Um, for us, what we've done is we've actually taken different points that are important to us. Uh, it can be anything. It can be we want to know when the photo loads. We want to know when the page is done. We want to know especially when the JS has finished downloading and executing so that every single button on the page that has a JavaScript action on it is fully usable and the page is what we consider to be in a done state. So we call this uh, just JS done for us. Like I said, different sites will have different important moments for you. And this is actually what we measure now to determine when a page is fully done and functional. Um, So again, the nice thing about this is the page is there, the photo is the most important thing, and you can view that before JS done, but JS done is sort of our, our final metric of when everything is ready. So what we do is we have a really basic system. We basically do um, timing. We get the Unix timestamp for when the page starts, and then at every important moment on the page. So we track when the head is done, when the body is done, uh, when the JS is done loading. We can track individual modules, how long they take. Uh, we can even track things like how long it takes YUI to calculate dependencies and that sort of thing. And then we take all these timestamps, uh, beacon them off to the browser, uh, sorry, to the server, and they just log them. And uh, we do this for 1% of our users. That sounds a little high. We actually had it at half that, so at a uh, one user out of every, um, sorry, so half a percent of all users. And we found that really wasn't enough data for us. 1% gives us nice, smooth lines on all of our graphs. And uh, 1% is, that's a lot of users. For any site that has a decent amount of traffic, 1% gives you a ton of data. So the trick is then, what do you do with all this data that you're beaconing off? Um, for us, we use uh, something called RRD tool. RRD stands for Round Robin Database. This is a really great idea. So when you're doing something like timing, you basically care about the moment you're in. So you care about timing for the current day you're on, the current week, the current month, the current year. And you don't really care about timing for a specific day three years ago. That's not really an important thing. So what a round robin database does is it takes a fixed number of slots in a database. So let's say it will have one for a month, which has 30 slots in it. And we'll store 30 bits of data. And then when that's full, it will bump one out and put the next one in. So what this means is that uh, we have super granular data for the given day, for the given week we're in, the given month we're in, and the given year. Jesus. Okay. And then we have really um, less granular data, averaged out data, for months in the past and years in the past. So we can say we want a current window of one day, one year, one month, three months, anything like that. And it will give us averages for all those data. Uh, this is an example of one of our dashboard pages. Um, on the left is logged out users, on the right is logged in. And this is aggregated across all browsers. Um, and the, the green is sort of the um, 25th to 50th percentile, and the red is the 50th to the 75th percentile, and the line in the middle is the average. Uh, this is a point Philip uh, mentioned in his talk, is that when you get things like page timing data and JS loaded data, you're going to get really strange aberrations. You're going to get outliers. We had one where it said a page took 72 days to load, and there's just, it's not even possible. Like, we hadn't even launched long enough at that point. Um, and who knows why this is? We, to be honest, we haven't gotten down to the, to the cause of it. So what we do is we take a level and we say anything longer than 30 seconds, uh, which again, as Phil pointed out, is sort of the time it takes to have a browser fail over to another DNS server anyway. Um, anything longer than 30 seconds, we just throw it out. We could probably do a smarter statistical analysis on this to say anything above a certain number of standard deviations we just chuck out. We've taken the easy approach here. This is time data for one page and one project. You don't want to get too crazy. And when you do that, you see nice, smooth graphs. And you can sort of even see the so this is three days. So you can sort of see our, our peak times when things get a little slower from the edge caching and from the page. Um, and this gives you data aggregated across all browsers, uh, which is OK. But the browsers are so different these days. I mean, the spectrum of what your users are using, it ranges from like you know development versions of Chrome and uh, Firefox and Safari, which are lightning fast, all the way down to older versions of Opera. IE6 users are still around, unfortunately. Um, we haven't taken them off the ground for browser support yet. Um, and really to lump all those browsers and all those connections and all the 
you know, uh, host computers that are using them and the amount of RAM they have on them and how maybe they have 16 tabs open in Firefox and one of them has a flash ad with somebody dancing on it, right? You really, you can't take all these things together and have them be meaningful. Um, so what we've done is the very first step of this is to take all the different browsers and we just track them individually. So we'll have a graph for i8 and i7 and i6 and Chrome and Safari. And this gets you a little way there. Um, what I would really like to do is have a reference system set up. So something that we just consider to be average. An average computer on an average connection with an average browser with an average number of RAM that we stick in a closet somewhere and have ping the page once a minute just to give us a baseline. So we know that if we deploy a bit of code that is really slow, a bit of GS that has some weird loop in it, and our reference system goes up, that that is an absolute increase in performance. Um, we know it's not some weird virus that's out there messing with our clients' machines. We know it's not an undersea cable cut out in Taiwan. We know that this is actually a problem. We haven't set this up yet. This is just an idea at this point. Um, another alternative is, again, to use Philips' boomerang system, which gives you data in this sort of nicely chunked out system. You can see data for people who have broadband connections, DSL, from high latency, low latency, different intels. Um, we have not gotten to that level of granularity, but it's really handy for determining exactly what's going on in your user's browsers. The IE8 graph is actually what we use to determine um, that there was a problem uh, a few weeks ago with the deploy. We deployed some code. All the graphs were fine, except the IE8 graph spikes. And we determined there was some little bit of code that had you know, triggered some strange uh, case in IE, and we fixed it, and spike went back down, back to normal. So um, just to give you a little overview, um, YOI3 is fantastic. If any of you guys are on the fence about switching from 2 to 3, um, do it. The time it takes is not insignificant, but it's a fairly mechanical process from converting over from YUI2 code to 3. And the performance benefits you get are huge. Just the code architecture benefits you get are enormous. Having everything in a module, everything have a set list of tendencies, um, it's just been great for us. Uh, we expect to have this sort of module loading architecture in place for the next 5 to 10 years. Even if the actual pieces, uh, the browser normalization, our actual modules change over time, the architecture we think is solid. Uh, we're going to keep it for a while. If you can't have real performance, um, fake it. Do things like having action queuing, showing loading indicators, having somebody click a button and see some sort of depressed state of the button, having a little spinning uh, ball. All that makes the biggest difference in the world. It's a difference between having your users bitching on the forums because everything is going wrong and your page takes too low to load and having them have a really happy experience. Dig really deeply into the JavaScript library you choose to use, whether it's YUI 2, 3, jQuery, Mover Tools, whatever. Make sure you actually know what's happening when you call these high-level functions. It's really easy to take a function, you know, why not do everything? And it's like, oh, it's only one function. My code is really terse. Um, it's got to be fast, but behind that, you have no idea what's happening. Uh, so dig into all your functions, dig into your animation libraries, dig into your XHR, dig into your uh, event libraries, and really figure out what's going on. So that when things like you know, jerkiness in i8 comes up, you can say, oh yeah, this is doing a lot of polling. Maybe it's just you know, CPU is running too hot. So you'll sort of know those things in advance. I just can't recommend this highly enough. We don't want to be um, the generation of front ends that only knows how to use a certain library. We still want to be JavaScript coders, you know. Measure the moments in the page that are important to you. Window.load isn't necessarily important to you. Um, just because it's an event the browser fires off doesn't mean it's something you have to track. For us, it's actually not an important event. Um, the important events for us are when the photo is visible and when the JS is loaded and the page is fully usable. So those are the ones we track. We don't care about DOM ready. We don't care about those other ones. Don't get hung up on pre-existing events. Um, I'm sure every single one of you has a different site with different, you know, important moments. Make sure you track all those. And uh, in closing, never include XXX in the URL <laughs> or the word ads or porn. It'll bite you down the road. Um, here's all the photos I use. All these slides are online uh, at lanyard.com slash SPDM, whatever that means. If you have any questions, uh, ask them now or later. Shoot me a line at ross at flickr.com. Any questions? Yeah. Have you guys tried doing like optimization for a specific user flow? So when you have like, I don't know, you know that 90% after a user visits page A, then it goes to 90% after that to page, specific page B, they kind of like prefetching that job. Yeah, that's a great. So I had a whole section in this I actually cut out. Um, yeah, so to repeat the question is do we do optimizations for specific user flows, specific interactions, specific use cases? 
Um, I actually had a whole section, which I pulled out because it wasn't very interesting, on how we do prefetching and preloading. So if you're on a particular photo page on Flickr, you're within a context. Um, maybe it's a set of photos, maybe it's within a group, maybe it's within a photo stream. And we know what the next and previous photos are. So what we do is we actually load a window of five photos around the current one you're on. So we'll load two uh, behind you, two in front of you. So if you start clicking the next button really fast, uh, we've got the photo already loaded. So it's just, you know, we've got the JS loaded, we've got the uh, photo loaded. So it's just doing the fetch of the page and all the SQL and database queries. Um, so yeah, we absolutely do that. Um, we've found that some users who have metered connections, some people who are on um, cell phones or in places in the world where they charge you by the kilobyte, really did not like that at all. Because we're loading like the large size of a photo just in case they want to view it. And for us, it's like, oh, it's in the background, it's after the page loads. It doesn't really matter. And to these users, they were seeing very high bills. Uh, and we don't like to mess with users' money. So we actually gave them a page where if they go to it, it will set a cookie. And that cookie will just disable all preloading across the, the entire photo page. So it's kind of nice to give them a way to shut it off. Because um, again, we don't want to like, you know, crush their next bill. So yeah, so we absolutely do that. Again, we have this user forum where people tend to go when they have problems. And there was a thread that says, you know, I'm on a meter connection and my bill's really high this month. And other people, oh yeah, I have this too, me too. Um, so we sort of have to depend on the user to know about it. Um, we've talked about it, it's there. We definitely don't want to message every user about this because this is such a tiny, tiny fraction of people who are on this. Um, you could probably do some sort of detection. Would you detect the bandwidth, obviously, on the, uh, on the meeting? That sure. If we detect something which we think falls in the range of a mobile bandwidth, or we detect something which is dial-up, we could probably just turn it off. Although it's almost like the dial-up users are the ones who need it the most. Because while they're sitting there viewing the page, we want to be using that, that slack time to absolutely be getting the next photo. So we don't really want to automatically do that. With the solution we have now is if they bitch, we tell them about it. And that's, it's OK. Um, it basically makes the angry users go away rather than fixes the problem. But it's, it's sort of a solution. So the question is, when we have action queues, uh, do we run them synchronously or asynchronously? Um, I guess the answer to that is asynchronously. So what we do is um, we'll have every single interim action tied to a module. So when somebody clicks on the favorites button, we'll have that tied to the favorites module. And when each one of those modules come in, um, most of the time it's all at once, but it could be you know, one here, one there. It will actually talk back to the action queue and say, I'm here, all my code's ready, what's happened? So I guess it's uh, asynchronously is a question. Is the answer. Yeah. Questions? Yeah? So you were talking about a large number of modules you're using. Mm -hmm. um, we actually test our remote on IE. No way. That, that it actually gives us a source thread for something like that. Have you encountered? No, so the question was um, have we encountered a slow script error on IE because we've hit too many modules? We have not. And we have a ton of them. Uh, I don't know what the exact number is, but our definition list is just pages and pages long. I get the feeling that if there's a slow script warning in IE, it's due to the dependency calculations. Um, and I guess maybe our calculations aren't that complicated. It's a good point. It's not something we've run into yet. Yep. So um, you were just talking about your big dependency list. And I thought I remember when I was looking at the code, it's written out on every page. Did you ever think about just making that a script resource as well so that it could be cached? Sure. We, uh, so the question is, um, <laughs> Have we thought about making our long, long module list um, an external JavaScript file, something that can be cached? Um, we haven't for a couple reasons. Um, one is that right now we have a single source of truth for modules across server side and client side. And the only way to do that really is to store it in the server side and then have it write out to the client side. Um, we could have it write out a pre-baked file, which we then access. Um, for a couple reasons, due to our development process and the way the page loads, we decided not to go that route. It also made more sense when we had a shorter list. Maybe it's something we revisit later. Um, because it's only going to get longer and longer, right? As, as we convert other pages over to this, it's going to get massive. So. Yeah, so we, we had the same problem. And, and once the module list got long, I was like, man, this is you know, 4 or 5K. I'm loading on every page. So we, we just had the server write out the thing dynamically. And then, uh, then use proper e tags and stuff to capture them as well. Yeah. And then version string that URL would have been great. Yeah, which we definitely have to do too. Yeah, 
Yeah, I've heard a lot of interesting custom solutions for dealing with these, you know, module lists. Um, this is the one we've used, but by no means do I think it's the ultimate solution. <laughs> I think it's something we're going to have to revisit it one day. Yeah, Philip. Yeah, um, so Philip's question is for browsers that support parallel loading of scripts, so we thought about moving our uh, code to the top. We have. Um, we've especially thought about moving the YUI seed to the top to at least get that in there. And then when we do things with our action queue, we can use nice YUI code if we want. Um, what we do now is we actually have code split into two requests anyway at the bottom of the page. Um, and we also do a few things where we say some modules, we want to be super high priority and we want to load these first. So we'll load those just a little bit sooner than the other ones. Um, it's definitely something we're playing around with. This is a fairly new page for us. And we're still, now that we have all this great performance data we're looking at, we can definitely make tweaks and say, oh, look, that dropped IE8 performance by 10 milliseconds, or it raised it. So now that we have that, we're definitely looking at doing something like that. Yeah. 